So without further ado, I request yeah. Professor yeah. Sunandu Dasgupta to start the talk. So once again, I uh, thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, uh, to this version of the ICOM 2023, and uh, I know that it's a difficult time to be the audience. And after a good lunch, uh, I I feel that if some of you would uh, be like this, I definitely would not mind. Okay. So uh, with with that, uh, I start my talk on uh, role of interfaces in the formation of cracks. So what would, could be the applications in physics and biology? So first of all, we would uh, I would like to uh, underline the importance of cracks. Why do they appear? What would be the potential uh, potential causes? The physics behind it, and uh, uh, what could be the possible remedies? And uh, how would the crack formation be different based on different parameters? For example. Uh, what you, on the nature of the substrate, on the nature of the liquid, and the nature of the suspended particles which are present. So I will discuss about that and then take a specific application of the concepts developed from the field of biology. Okay. Uh, before that, uh, just a brief introduction of what our group is engaged in in the area of microfluidics. We work on liquid thin films especially an extended meniscus, the intermolecular forces which are present in it, and how the shape-dependent intermolecular force field can be obtained by an image analysis of the interfer interfer using interferometry and ellipsometry together. Uh, digital microfluidics, droplet microfluidics, is also an area in which uh, I have worked uh, quite, quite a bit. And uh, recently, I'm more interested in biomicrofluidics, the detection of diseases, and so on. And uh, I would cover part of that in this. Crack, as I said, the formation of cracks, the physics of the cracks, is another area in which our group is engaged in. Uh, we are also started working on the uh, energy storage devices, especially what happens during the charging of a battery near the near the solid electrolyte interface. So there's a lot of application of interfacial phenomena in battery, in the designing of the charging st strategy, and so on. Uh, behavior of liquids, droplets, on soft surfaces, that's one of the other areas in which uh, some of my students work. And of course, to tie everything together, we have extensive modeling, including MD simulation, for uh, the exp to explain the experimental results that uh, the our group generate, but uh, in in today I'm going to uh, I'm going to concentrate on the crack dynamics and connect it with the blood uh, blood microfluidics. Uh, first of all, uh, why crack? Because the say as the saying goes, there's a crack in everything. And that's how the light gets in. So cracks play a very important role in all our lives. Uh, to give a topical example of how cracks affect us from everyday life to culture, the history, and the history of painting, I once again invoke the famous painting of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. And what you see here is the famous face. Now, in 2016, I think, someone has done, took a high resolution image of the face and marked different regions. So, so this is one, sec second, and the third. And you could see that at high resolution and high magnification, you could see the cracks. So why did the cracks form? Okay. In some cases, it, can, it, was also, uh, it was also correlated to the painting style. There's a specific painting style which was used by the artist. One coat and then a coat again. So, depend, so it would tell us, the, the analysis of the cracks would tell us where there are multi coats, where there is a single coat, what kind of, what kind of uh, conditions it went through, and so on. So that's a very interesting paper in Journal of Applied Physics that uh, worked on the images of Mona Lisa. 
Uh, the remedies of crack arrest, arrest, these are probably known to you. Uh, I'll quickly go through it. Like you can, we can change the suspension uh, composition. We can vary the property of the suspended particles in terms of their size, shape, and so on. The drying methodology can be changed in order to have a more uniform coating on a surface. And the substrate property variation, so the rigidity, the surface weight, weightability, they can alter the nature, the formation, the propagation, and the nature of the cracks. And it is on the surface weightability on which I would concentrate for this part of my talk. So drying of colloidal systems, of course, one very good example would be how do I create functional coatings and paints. These are some, these are few issues which we come across almost every day. Uh, there's another one where the dried droplet of blood can be used for disease detection and it's also equally important in forensics. So in a crime scene, the drop of dried blood can tell us many things about the, about the crimes and so on. So there are some active research which is going on in forensic science about how to interpret the dried droplet of blood. So this is, these, these two are the uh, these two are the motivations for our uh, present work. But first I start with uh, drying of colloidal systems. So it's a three component system as I said, mostly depending on the substrate, the colloid and the solvent. So let's say you have a one microliter droplet, you place it on a substrate. So there's going to be evaporation and near the contact line, most of the droplets are going to be going to go towards the edge as the evaporation progresses. And we are going to have a compaction front consisting mostly of the solvent, very little solvent, and most of the solutes which are going to be present near the edges. This is going to create stress. A significant amount of stress is going to create, going to be created during the drying and the formation of the compaction front. The only way this stress can be released is by the formation of cracks. So this is what, in a nutshell, why and how the crack forms. Now, uh, you could also guess that the drying methodology would strongly depend on the nature of the surface. Because a droplet dries differently on a hydrophobic surface or on a hydrophilic surface. It will, it will, it will uh, dry differently on a soft surface or on a rigid surface. So how would that affect the cracks? That's, uh, that's going to be the first uh, part of my work, talk. As I mentioned, it's a three component system. And uh, yeah, the f this one is about hydrophobic and hydrophilic, the shape of the droplet, the surface weightability controls the shape and therefore the drying, pat drying rate, drying pattern and so on. The solvent polarity. If it's water, it would behave differently as compared to if it's IPA. So why would the why would the property of the liquid, the solvent, would dictate the nature of the patterns which are going to form, the nature of the cracks which are going to form? And of course, the if the particles, the suspended particles are charged, they are also going to change the nature of the cracks. So we have taken picked up three surfaces. Uh, one is hydrophilic, uh, just plain glass with a contact angle of about 5, intermediate, uh, which is about, so this is plasma treated, this is plain glass, and this is made hydrophobic by spin coating it with PDMS, cured at some temperature with a thickness of about of the order of 10 micron. And the variation in contact angle is between 5 to 96, and you could see that when I have a colloidal suspension of 1 micron particles, it's not going to be much different with, with, with the, in terms of contact angle, it's not going to be much different. So the experiment is pretty simple. We have a colloidal suspen a suspension of one microliter in, uh, sorry, it's 53 uh, nanometer uh, particles. We let it evaporate at ambient temperature with controlled humidity. The formation of cracks are going to be recorded and then we are going to extract the images and from there we would find out what's the crack dynamics. The, from the onset of the formation of the cracks to how they propagate, that's what we are going to pick up through the image analysis. And once the 
crack formation, the propagation of the crack is stopped, then we are going to look at the colloidal thin films using confocal microscopy, which would give us the thicknesses of the cracks. And we are going to go, uh, we're going to look at it using AFM, which would tell us something about the morphology or how the particles are going to be arranged near the periphery. So I would quickly show you a video of uh, how that behavior is different. So we have this droplet on the hydrophilic surface. And if you wait for some time, uh, I, could, I could have advanced it, but since I cannot do it from here, you would see the formation of cracks. This is the compaction front. And you could uh, see the difference in compaction front for the hydrophilic substrate and for the hydrophobic surf substrate. Right, so uh, the compaction front and uh, very quick, uh, you are going to see the f formation of the first crack on the hydrophilic surface. That's the initiation of the first crack. And uh, the more and more cracks will follow. And it's almost going to be covered with cracks. And there, there's going to be interconnects as well. This is on a hydrophobic, hydrophilic surface. So the number of cracks, the size of the cracks, and the arrangement of the cracks are going to be completely different when you go to hydrophobic surface. And uh, you could see that the, the compaction front is getting more and more distinct. And uh, we will see uh, the formation of the cracks uh, very shortly. And uh, that's the first crack that you see over there, second, third, and so on. Now, the major difference that one can see is that the cracks are wide. The number of cracks are definitely less. And compared to the arrangement, what you have seen here, they look totally different. So we got interested in why would that be? Why would hydrophobic and hydrophobic sub substrates make such a difference in terms of drying of the same droplet with the same concentration of the colloidal particles. So why would a film crack? So that's the first question that one has to answer. So it's generally due to capillary stresses. And if you think about the amount of stress that is generated when a, when a dr solvent dries in between two droplets, the, um, the, the, the stress could be as high as 350 to 350 atmosphere. And the elastic energy that is used to create crack formation from the literature, you could find it's of this formula, where the H is the film thickness and other parameters are already known. And the crack formation, during the crack formation, the, this energy is going to be supplied by the film. And this is the surface energy per unit crack area. And the surface energy per unit, uh, crack, surface energy per unit crack area for hydrophobic and hydrophilic surfaces are different. That they, it has already been calculated. It has already been reported. So this, uh, this is the relation which we have to keep in mind. So less energy will be required to initiate crack formation. And since less energy is necessary to create to initiate crack formation, the number of cracks on the hydrophilic surfaces are going to be substantially more than those on the hydrophobic surfaces. If we probe it a little bit more, uh, where does it end? How does it end? How the crack is going to get arrested? So the crack is going to get arrested when these two energies are going to be equal. And by, from that, you could find out what's the number of cracks as well. So based on the properties of the of the of the solvent, you could calculate uh, how many what's the number of cracks that you could expect for a hydrophobic and for a hydrophilic surface. So uh, these are the these are the images of the cracks and the crack for the crack arrest. This is the formula. This is the relation which has to be satisfied. And you could figure out what is going to be the value of sigma and the different types of cracks. So hair-like network structure to trenches that you, that you can clearly see in the, in the confocal image of the, height of the crack on hydrophobic surface tells us important, important in, gives us important information about what is in there. So uh, the number of cracks I have shown it to dis discuss this formula before. 
and uh, if I could plot the number of cracks as a function of the contact level, you could see that for a highly hydrophobic surface, the number is going to be about 100, whereas for the case of a close to hydrophilic surface, the number is going to be about an order, order of magnitude higher. So, uh, <coughs> we could also find out what is going to be the velocity with which the tip of the crack progresses. So if we can, uh, we did f experimentally find out what is the progression, velocity with which the crack tips progress through the colloidal suspension. And here also the interesting thing is that, that significant difference between the hydrophilic, the intermediate and hydrophilic are almost the same, but the hydrophilic and hydrophobic, these two are going to be drastically different. So from 300 micron per second to about 25 micron per second. So there are several uh, theories, several models which explain crack formation or the propagation of the cracks. I will not go into the details of this, uh, but the uh, one, res one specific result that would, I would like to show you, these are confocal images of the cracks on different surfaces. So what is going to be the fracture criterion that can be evaluated and when you, uh, when you, when you calculate the numbers, you are going to see that the films on hydrophobic surfaces have a higher threshold stress limit and therefore it will resist the formation of crack better than on a hydrophilic surface. So I leave this slide. So the major takeaway from the first part of my talk would be that the surface particle interaction is strongly influenced by the surface weightability. The nature is going to be different, the numbers are going to be different, the sizes are also going to be different. So the hydrophobic surfaces are, will, be, will be, you will see wider trenches on hydrophobic surfaces <coughs> as compared to that on hydrophilic surfaces. Secondly, the surface energy, if you reduce the surface energy, that changes the crack propagation velocity, which I have shown uh, with the two values, the two measured values of 325 micron per second. And finally, the better resistance to crack formation is on a film of hydrophobic surface. Next, we quickly move on to the solvent part. If the solvent is polar and if the solvent is apolar, what is going to be the difference between the, between, between the different cracks? And here I get into the concept of the extended meniscus where these are the particles. And from over here, this is the transition region and this is the adsorbed thin film region in which the attractive van der Waals attractive force is going to be significant. So this is, this is governed by the intermolecular, in the intermolecular force. This region is governed by the capillary force and in the transition region, both the intermolecular and the capillary forces are important. And since the molecules of the solvent are not bound strongly to the substrate, because of this distance, maximum evaporation is possible from this area, whereas no evaporation is possible from the adsorbed thin film. So what we have done is we have taken a solution, dilute solution of the, of, of the dilute solution or rather dilute suspension and looked at the interferometric images when you shine a monochromatic light on a curved film. So when you shine a monochromatic light on a curved film, you will see these fringes and the fringes not only give you the thickness at every bright and the dark dark max every maxima and the minima if you can plot you can figure out what is going to be the curvature what is going to be the apparent contact angle and so on so we extensively used this in image analyzing interferometry to look at the to look at the fringes for polar with some size of the some size of the suspended particle a larger size of the suspended particle, water with the same size and the larger size. And through this, we, 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 found, we tracked the receding meniscus as the evaporation was taking place. And we also looked at when the thin film ruptures and creates islands from where the trenches are going to form. In the deweighted solid surface, we have also looked at. And we, uh, I will not go into again the details of this, but uh, we calculated what would be the van der Waals force for the pure liquid, for the polar liquid, the electrostatic component, the colloidal suspension, the particle absorption structuring. And what it tells us is that the contact line velocity, the velocity with which the contact line moves back 
during the drying process is inversely related to the disjoining pressure. So disjoining pressure is nothing but the pressure which is there in a thin film that separates the gas or the vapor from the solid. So more the disjoining pressure, higher is going to be the thickness of the thin liquid film. So this relationship is also shown to be valid for the drying of colloidal suspensions, be it polar or be it apolar, but the, the electrostatic interactions play a major role for the case of polar liquids. So I leave this, but uh, let's move on to the application of the cracks. So <clears throat> the, the concepts that we have developed, we thought that can there be something in biological systems where these cracks do appear and where the crack characteristics can be a pointer to specific diseases. So that's what we are going to look at uh, the distinct the patterns in the, the drying patterns. The first one is a beautiful picture. Uh, of a drying water droplet and you could clearly see the satellite droplets during the drying process as they get ejected. The different patterns are a result of physical properties, what is there in the liquid, the size of the cells of the particles which are present in the droplet and nature of the substrate as I have discussed before. So the first idea came from uh, a research which was done uh, which is known as the Litos test. So this is a diagnostic, diagnostic technique uh, which looking at the urine salts from the kidney stones as they leave a specific pattern as compared to the healthy ones. So that's the first, uh, first start of using the drying pattern for disease detection. And then came the uh, phenomenal work of Cephine and uh, where uh, by looking at the at the drop at the blood at the blood droplet uh, after it dries he could distinguish between breast cancer lung cancer and several other diseases so there are distinct patterns so then we thought that since we have we know about cracks we have looked at cracks why not look look at for some in a use it in a biological system and uh, so we have to pick a specific disease that has relevance, whose detection in normal methods are difficult and which is quite a common problem in parts of our country. So uh, what we wanted to look at is the, the interfacial attributes in the formation of dried blood droplets. And as the droplet dries, there's going to be cell-cell and cell-substrate interactions. So we wanted to explore how these two interactions can give rise to specific patterns on the droplet of blood, urine, or teardrop. So we wanted to concentrate only on blood. And uh, then we came across uh, another paper by Brotin in 2011, where he showed is what is going to look like, what is a dried droplet of blood look like for the healthy, and for anemia and for hyperlipidemia. So these three ones, which he has extensively probed and found out that there is a signatory pattern. During our interaction with doctors from Calcutta Medical College, uh, we came to know that uh, thalassemia is a major problem in parts of coastal India. So this thalassemia, so they, they conduct camps regularly in those areas and they send the samples back to the major cities where they undergo an extensive testing process to find out if someone is a carrier or if someone has the de developed disease. So we, uh, we wanted to probe whether the thalassemia containing blood or the carriers which who are still carriers but hasn't shown the full effect of the disease can they be detected by looking at the droplet of blood, their, their blood, when it dries on some surface. So the uh, major reason is that the unavailability of rapid and on-field carrier detection method that is, uh, that is creating a huge workload for hospitals across India. 
so the methods that we we took that these are standard protocols which you will have to will have to be followed if you are doing any biological study you have to characterize the system you have to have the the informed consent and so on so we have done all that and there are other properties of the blood which will have to be have to be uh, evaluated before you start your test for example the major two two differences what you see is that between the healthy the zeta potential is different the mcv and mch are slightly depressed but there is no difference in the in the viscosity or in the contact angle so we then thought that uh, the experiments that are very simple so two microliter blood droplets on glass slides multiple droplets are placed on the glass slides so as to compare and then they are allowed to dry the drying time is roughly about 15 to 20 minutes and then you look at the patterns under a microscope and what you would see is these are the patterns what you would see between the healthy and the diseased ones so here itself you can see for the healthy the num the cracks are lesser in number but they are longer as compared to the diseased ones so the final results look something like this so for the carrier ones the mean length is about 680 microns whereas for the healthy ones it's about 1000 and above so we got interested in can this be a marker for the for the uh, thalassemia carriers so this is what we have started looking at and the volume of blood used is 2 microliter only and uh, what we found is that significantly shorter radial cracks and uh, one could also say that why did not we consider the midsection where there is a definite change in the uh, in in the in the uh, absorbance value or uh, the color is darker at the center but what we found out it's difficult to characterize this completely whereas the crack lengths are easier to measure and uh, it is easier to correlate with the disease so these are the comparisons between the healthy and the, the other one. So the highest that we got is about 1400, the lowest is about 800, and, <coughs> and uh, there we, the, uh, the number finally is about 970 and 652. So there is about a 300 micron difference between the thalassemia carrier and the healthy blood. So that's... Uh, we have done the uh, analysis that's, uh, that are common in these cases. So this is where the carrier lies and we have done the 99% confidence limit and the threshold upper limit has been calculated, has been calculated and therefore the major takeaway from this work is that if the crack length is more than 800 microns, it is going to be normal, if not, it is going to be carrier. But these are with some uh, like with the, some volunteers, we need we needed to do the blind testing. So we con we again contacted the uh, international. Uh, we again contacted the Calcutta Medical College and for, uh, uh, requested them to provide us blind samples. So they gave us hundred samples. Some containing some are carriers of thalassemia, some are not. So we have done the uh, analysis without knowing what each type of blood represents and we mark them to be carriers and we mark them to be normals and send them back to the medical college where it has gone through the gold standard state, uh, test. The major part of this is there are zero false negative results. So that gave us confidence that our method is at least figuring out the, the cases where there are where there is there are possibilities that it they are going to be carriers of thalassemia it is not a definitive test it is only going to indicate that these these samples are most likely not going to have any thalassemia and the zero false negative results give, gives gives us uh, uh, enough confidence to uh, patent this and we have published this as well uh, but the question comes why? Why would uh, the crack length be different for, for these cases? So these are the SEM images showing, showing the stacking of red blood cells in the dried droplet. So you could see that they are like pillars, pillars of cells 
which are close to each other when you dry them. And if you look again closely, that you would see that they are going to interact between, there is going to be cell-cell interaction, and for the bottom layer, there's going to be cell-substrate reaction. So we wanted to delve into that to figure out what is going to be the cell-cell and the cell-substrate interaction, and whether that tells us something about the, about the different natures. So uh, when you place the drop of blood on the surface, the distances are quite large between the cells and the substrates and so on. So that's more or less the lowest energy state. Let's say that state, we say that it's going to be zero. The state two represents an intermediate state of drying just before the crack formation. So the cells are coming closer to each other, the cells are coming nearer to the substrate, so stresses are going to be generated, and the stresses keep on generating with the drying till the time comes when the blood, when the droplet ruptures and cracks will form. So once the formation is complete, then it goes back to its original state. So from zero to very high energy, and then the energy is released by the crack formation. So this is, this is uh, roughly the path followed by, this, uh, by the drying process. So one can f look at the literature and figure out, uh, find out the different uh, expressions for the, uh, what would be the energy, what would be the uh, energy, form, energy during drying and so on. And as a first generation model, we have proposed, we have conjectured that conjectured that the energy of the healthy and energy E2, the maximum energy due for the healthy and the maximum energy for the, for the carrier are roughly going to be proportional to the volume of the crack which is formed. And the volume of the crack is, will, will again scale with the area of the crack since through, at, through atomic force microscopy, we found that the depth of the crack is the same in between the healthy and the carrier ones. So this is roughly the scaling that, uh, that, is, that can be assumed to follow in a first generation model for the crack formation in blood droplets. So then comes the interaction energy. So we have the cell-cell interaction energy and cell-substrate cell, cell -substrate interaction energy which have standard formulas and most of the parameters are known. The Hamaker constant for the cell, su cell substrate and for the cell cell can also be can also be calculated. So we, we found out what are these UCS and UCC for both the healthy and for the carrier. And uh, what we found is that the equally the healthy and the, the HCS is roughly going to be the, of, the, of the order of dy Huckel length, which is between 0.5 to 1 nanometer. The equilibrium HCC can also be calculated based on the stacking of the cells, and it is about 10 nanometer. And each cell surface, it plays a more dominant role on the formation of the cracks uh, as compared to HCC. And uh, as I said, the energy the energy stored energy for the healthy is going to be significantly higher than the stored energy for the carrier. So, this considering these uh, these numbers, once again, there are definitely some assumptions involved, and uh, so they, uh, therefore it's not a definitive model. I would stress that once again. So, the order of magnitude analysis gives us the area of the crack for the healthy and area of the crack for the for the carrier is going to be roughly about 1.3 now what we did is we also cal measured <coughs> based on our experimental results what is this a crack healthy and a crack carrier and we saw that it is about 1.4 so looking at the looking at the complexities of the drying process of a very very complex fluid this variation, I think, it, uh, has given us a lot of, lot of confidence that, yes, uh, we have understood some part of it, at least the drying process for the case of blood. And uh, we, so finally, this is, I show this once again, that the crack length can be an indicator. It's an indicator. It's not a definitive test. It's an indicator for the, for the, uh, presence or absence of thalassemia carriers in blood and which in turn would reduce the load on the hospitals 
uh, by a considerable amount. And we have also automated the process such that in a low resource setting areas, you can simply have the, the, the persons or the doctors or the, or the doctor's assistants let the blood dry on a, on a piece of clean glass, take a picture, send it to the server, and the server automatically analyzes the images and gives you whether or not it falls in the career category or in the, in the, in the healthy category. And we have tested our, uh, this app on uh, real, sis, real, uh, real samples and we found that, the, uh, that our app and the results are, are within 0.2% error. There's only a 0.2% error. So finally, uh, I would end this with uh, uh, the comments that the cell substrate and cell-cell interactions are going to play a prominent role in the formation, in the shape, and the size of the cracks for dried blood droplets. So these this shapes of the cracks, the number of the cracks, can tell us, can act as a biomarker for a, a specific disease, thalassemia, and uh, this, the ultimate result is uh, rapid automated screening of <coughs> thalassemia in low resource settings. We did not do something that I, I must uh, say it here itself. We worked only on beta thalassemia. We did not work on alpha, th uh, alpha, alpha, alpha thalassemia. So since beta thalassemia is more prevalent in this part of the world, <coughs> so <coughs> we considered the samples that we obtained are all beta thalassemia. So we do not know how would it uh, work on other types of thalassemia. Secondly, we have, we have seen that the anemic patients, for them, these results will still be valid. So anemia would not interfere with the results that I have shown here. But there can be other diseases which will have, which may affect the result of this study which is still ongoing. So I cannot say definitely that for all persons this is going to be the test. And uh, I should uh, acknowledge my uh, past PhD students and my uh, present PhD students. And I would also like to acknowledge uh, the first part of the work. Uh, I collaborated with Professor Shuman Chakraborty and uh, the work was ma mainly done by uh, Dr. Udita Ghosh, Dr. Manoji Chakraborty, and Dr. Ranavid De. In uh, the second part of the work, the thalassemia work, I uh, collaborated with Professor Devashi Sharkar of the Calcutta University and Calcutta Medical College. And this was, this was done by Dr. Monikuntala Mukhopadhyay. All of them who have graduated are either faculty at different IITs or are doing postdocs. And I must also uh, thank the collaborators, other collaborators uh, from abroad and the sponsors, especially IIT Kharagpur. And uh, I end this with a picture of where we, where I came from. And uh, the picture that you see is, is, is a cellular gel, which was used to house the freedom fighters uh, during the struggle for freedom of India. And not, this was the first place where the first IIT of our nation started. So with that, I end. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Dasgupta, for this interesting talk. It is uh, indeed exciting to see how understanding of crack formation can be used to detect thalassemia. So now the floor is open to questions. Two questions. Uh, one is uh, that uh, does humidity play any role on the uh, crack length? And the second one is you have used two microliter of the droplets. Does the volume of the droplet also play any role or not? Yes. Uh, yes to both. Uh, we checked with two microliters and with four microliters. The patterns did not change. Yeah. The numbers were still within that the threshold one. But the four microliter takes more time to evaporate. So the humidity would be uh, would be would affect the pro would may affect the process. So we stuck with two microliters, and humidity can play a role because it's going to affect the evaporation rate 
and the evaporation rate would affect the uh, stacking of the cells and so on. So we have done it in a controlled environment. I wouldn't say control, it's just inside an AC air conditioned room, nothing else. So that is a very good point yeah. that uh, humidity can play a role, but the volume between 2 and 4, we did not see any difference. Okay, thank you. Sir, a very nice piece of work. Uh, one question I have is uh, when you what you talked about the blood cell, you know, when they make a pattern. Uh, if we select a droplet of let's say cancer cells, which are of higher uh, you know dimensions, so could you comment on if there can be any pattern of drying for different like? I think there was one figure you were showing. Could you please explain again? Uh, this uh, that study of different cancer types and the uh, patterns that one can expect has been done in 2014 uh, and uh, this I will show you the figure. There are two uh, cases, one is breast cancer, the other is lung cancer and uh, it was published in 2014. Now if you look at just those two, the column B and C, there is a difference. But is it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not very confident that to say that uh, I'd be able to pick up the difference between B1 and C1. So there is an effort to do that, but uh, the tests or rather the patterns are not as definitive as the crack lengths because length is something you can measure. Whereas uh, B1 and C1, how do you distinguish between them? I'm not very sure. But there is still uh, considerable work going on between in, in to examine the patterns of blood as they dry uh, and use that as a biomarker for many for other diseases. Yes. So, so also, could you please comment on uh, means let's say when they dry, there is a movement happening like in the droplet as well. So the particle size, how they move during the evaporation. Yes. That will change. So that 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 will that will affect the uh, whole process because I have shown you some results in which we have used 0.5 uh, or 55 micron, sorry, 55 uh -huh. nanometer uh -huh. and one micron, and there we could see the difference in the contact line velocity uh, and uh, a difference in in the in the rate of drying. So yes, the particle sizes do matter. Uh, not only particle sizes, the charges on the particle also. Uh, will play will also play a role as uh, important role. So we I have got the results, but I don't have the explanation yet. So I am not showing that here. So so also when you increase the size, let's say to the twenty micron, you have a bigger droplet. Droplet. Sometimes they also settle down while we place yes. it. So right. that gravity will also come into picture. So gravity is there any may come into picture, yes. but the uh, the time scale of evaporation uh -huh. and the settling time. Yes. If they are different, then this technique will not have any okay. problem. Okay. And uh, one more thing, if the particle size is large, then uh, we have used light ray, the monochromatic ray, to figure out, uh, to see the interference fringes. So if we have larger number of particles, then there will be scattered, there will be the scattering points of light, which may affect the uh, measurement technique. Got it. Sir. Thank you very much. Nice presentation, sir. Uh, so could you comment on the uh, healthy dried blood? So uh, the cell, do their properties change? Their properties do not change significantly. I have shown you a table somewhere here where we have measured different properties and the most important properties are the zeta potential, MCV and MCH. So for, th uh, for carriers of thalassemia, MCV and MCH are depressed to some extent. Uh, so from 30 and 24, 90 and 70. So these two will be depressed, will be, will be lesser for the case of thalassemia content. Uh, but uh, that is there is not a mm, definitive this thing. There can be other reasons which would result in a lowering of MCV or MCH. So uh, that's why I, I mentioned that the cross effect of other diseases uh, we haven't looked at uh, in this study, but which has to be done. So what about the properties of the red blood cells itself? Like uh, have, have do they change like uh, during evaporation? During evaporation, they may not change. During evaporation, they remain constant, but uh, the shape of the red blood cell uh, 
uh, that's also an indicator of the presence or absence of diseases. So in some cases, the red blood cells also get deformed. So that 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 is that is, uh, for example, uh, they they lose their plate-like uh, characteristics or circular circular uh, shape. Mm. So that that can also uh, happen when you have someone who may not be for carriers of thalassemia, but for full-blown thalassemic patients, the shapes of the uh, red blood cells are different and the red blood cells will disintegrate. The, their, the blood will have less oxygen carrying capacity. So those all are indicators of the presence of thalassemia. So yes, the shapes will change. So if there are no more questions, then let's mm -hmm. thank Professor Dasgupta once again. And we would like to offer a token of appreciation to Professor Dasgupta.